Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's 7.30 a.m. This is the Utah Lake Commission Governing Board meeting for the 16th of November, 2017. We welcome you all here and thank you for making the effort to get here so early in the morning. For that, there's a little prize for you at the table over here. Get yourself a drink and a bagel or a donut. Reward yourself for your efforts this morning. Before we begin, I'd like to turn some time over to Sam Breger and have him explain to us what we have with our uh, photos here on the tables on the east wall. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, as you'll note, as the roll gets passed around, there's a second sheet underneath it, which is actually a request form. If you look on the on the far wall here, these are actually our some of our winners from our photo contest that we just ran, our annual photo contest. The three categories that are printed are wildlife, scenic, and fun at the lake. So when you get a minute, just glance over there when you get the roll. If there's one you see you'd like, um, Eric and I are going to organize an order and print one for each of your offices. Um, so you can place that where you will. We'll also have a little nice plaque that'll have the, you know, the photographer's name, their title, and such on it. So please make sure you take a look at it. Like I said, there's just an order form. Pretty simple. You just put your name and your organization, and I'll make sure to reach out to you that we get that. Um, sent over to you just as a thank you to the governing board as well as an effort to make sure that we are showing the world in all of our locations just how beautiful Utah Lake is. Thank you. Thank you. So now with today's agenda was copies of the financials for September and October 2017 as well as the minutes of our last governing board meeting of September the 28th 2017. Is there a motion to approve the common consent agenda? As motion to approve. Second. I have a motion for Mayor Wilson, seconded by Mayor Thompson. I have had no uh, request to alter the minutes in any way, shape, or form, and therefore we would ask that uh, they be approved as presented. Uh, I have a motion before me and a second. I'll call for a voice vote. All in favor say aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item three is executive director's project report. Eric, I'll turn the floor to you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, to start off, we have been working this all summer long on, on improving messaging on Utah Lake and perceptions. One of the projects that we undertook was to find a, a videographer that could put together a cool uh, slideshow or, or, or video on the fun activities around Utah Lake. So, we're going to take a few minutes and watch uh, a segment from that uh, clip. This is a Steve, a Steve Penline production. He has a perfect voice for narrating these types of videos, so enjoy, hopefully. Surrounded by majestic mountains, a recreational jewel exists in central Utah, in close proximity to a large and burgeoning population center. As this population continues to grow, demands for recreational opportunities will increase as well. For a century and more, local sportsmen have faced tenant and enjoyed the recreational opportunities that Utah Lake provides. Many changes have occurred throughout the years, but there has also been one constant. The fishing remains fantastic and is only getting better with the many projects designed to maintain and improve the fishery and the lake. Technology has changed as well. Today, one finds ski and wakeboard boats, personal watercraft, as well as kiteboards, paddleboards, kayaks, and other watercraft on the water as families from the surrounding communities expand their outdoor lifestyles. At 24 miles in length and nearly 13 miles wide, 
The lake is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the western U.S. Two major tributaries, the Provo River and the Spanish Fork River, both born in the surrounding high mountains, provides a lake with much of its water. During the 1950s, with the general prosperity, many families bought a motorboat and learned to water ski on the lake. A tractor tire tube was a precursor to today's highly decorated inflatables that are pulled behind a specially designed ski and wakeboard boats. By the 1970s, the tasty walleye now found in the lake cut the fancy of local anglers, and each year a legion of fishermen could be found waiting in the lake casting an oars for the walleye during the spring spawning season that brought the fish into the shallows. What great fun it was in the beginning of a ritual, still followed by anglers after more than 40 years. One of the greatest parts of Utah Lake is the fact that there are so many different fish species that anglers can target. Walleye is probably one of the most popular, every spring especially. Uh, they're so popular because they're so tasty. But we also have very large channel catfish, or full head catfish. We've got perch, we've got white bass. There's no limit on the white bass. They're very good to eat as well. I mean, the, the different numbers of uh, fish, the species, that makes it a great place to go fishing. And uh, we would like the people to actually discover Utah Lake and spend more time fishing there. Since our introduction, Carp have represented a large portion of the lake's biomass, and although they have been detrimental to the fishery and the lake in general, no one can dispute that either caught accidentally by snagging or caught intensely, they are great fighters that tax the limit of the angler's tackle. The story of the lake's history with the carp that were introduced into the lake in the 1800s is changing today thanks to a strange bedfellow, the rare and endangered June sucker. There are several non-native species in Utah Lake which have greatly affected June sucker, mainly uh, common carp. And they affect June sucker by feeding on the vegetation that juveniles need to survive in the lake. They've really been a number on vegetation in Utah Lake, and it's, it's made it really difficult for these fish to reproduce in the lake naturally. So what we've done in 2009, we started a carp removal program, and since 2009, we've removed about 25 million pounds of carp, and that has resulted in a biomass reduction of carp in Utah Lake of about 80%. And what that's done is it's brought back some of the vegetation beds in Utah Lake, which are critical, they're absolutely critical to our survival of the new mountain sucker. And that's ultimately what uh, we think will bring the gene sucker back. Uh, what, what will help it recover where it's no longer in danger of extinction. The common carp is not the only invasive species that has been detrimental to the lake and the surrounding ecosystem. The shoreline has become infested by the highly invasive Pragmite plant. Hundreds of acres of wildlife habitat and water resources have been negatively impacted by this fast-growing plant. Utah County has been aggressive with their efforts to eliminate the Pragmite by spraying and then crushing the plant. Their efforts have been largely successful, but will require constant vigilance to keep these undesirable plants at bay. Through the years, many changes have been directed at improving the lake and the recreational opportunities. Marinas have been constructed around the lake 
to the benefit of boaters and anglers. Those efforts and more continue with harbor dredging and a continuing construction of family-oriented park facilities. Today, there are five marinas on the Big Lake, and without exception, good fishing can be found in close proximity to any of these facilities. In addition to the walleye fishing, several other game species make fishing in Utah Lake, an adventure for the angler. White bass schools are prolific, and the population is healthy. Largemouth bass grow to trophy proportions in the diverse habitat. Arguably, the second most sought after species are the catfish. This hard fighting fish is found throughout the lake and are caught with any number of baits. Panfish such as perch, crappie, and bluegill are caught as well. Northern pike also inhabit the lake, but not in any numbers. Anglers enjoy catching them, even if it is incidental to fishing for walleye or white bass. With its abundance of sport fish year-round, as well as other boating opportunities across the lake, it becomes apparent why more and more of Utah's families are taking advantage of the lake's camping, boating, fishing, and many other activities. That's your teaser. So in addition to this 10-minute this, this video, uh, we'll be getting a, a shorter three-minute and one-minute uh, clip, as well as a, a fishing-specific uh, video that will encourage people to get out there and fish and talk about specific baits and that type of thing. So we'll be inter interspersing those in our social media outreach and so forth. Um, so let's talk real quick about lake condition. Uh, the lake has kind of leveled off at about four feet below compromise this year. Uh, about this time last year we were seven and a half, almost eight feet below compromise. So we're in a much better position. Uh, heading into the winter water year, so cross your fingers that we get lots of snow this year and can have a follow-up big snow year and, and actually fill uh, Utah Lake and send a little down to the Great Salt Lake. Uh, did, did you want to talk about the finishing of the algae bloom, Erica? Um, just that you know, cooler weather's helping us and so we're asked Stop monitoring the fish there. Yes. Um, just a question. So, smash work has been running pretty high a long time. Are we pouring, pouring the lake or pushing it down to Utah Lake? What, uh, October 15th is when the pumps stopped running on the north end of the lake. And so, what it likely has done is, is equalized it with. I mean, we still had some pretty nice warm weather, and so evaporation was probably still in full effect towards the end of the summer. Uh, but it appears that it has <coughs> leveled out quite well, because at our last meeting, we were at about four feet below, so 
uh, that has been very helpful in stabilizing the uh, from a level standpoint. Uh, this fall right now we have waterfowl hunts going on, there's great fishing down in the lake, so we're encouraging people to get out and, and experience that. I was told by uh, one individual that they saw more duck hunters out on the lake on the opener than they'd ever seen before, and so that's promising news that, that the habitat anyway is doing really great around the uh, shorelines of the lake. Uh, state park dredging. We don't have the state parks individually here today, but uh, my latest information is that the contract for the dredging effort went to state purchasing, uh, went through that process, uh, and that they were they already just had or were about to have a mandatory site visit by potential bidders on that dredging project at the state park. So their goal is to have. Do you have an update on that? Yeah, part? I think they picked a contractor. That's the email I got last night. Awesome. Because I believe one's in place. Okay. And so their goal, all along, anyway, has been to get that dredging work done over the winter months and some, at some benchmark early in the spring. I'm not sure what that'll be. They would like to have that completed and <coughs> reopen. Their, their plan is to dredge the inner harbor, the channel out to the inlet, and then extend the the boat ramps uh, within that inner harbor where boats are launching so that they're not dropping off the end at, at low lake levels. So we're excited about that. Uh, Phragmites removal. As you know, we every year we do a, a huge spray with the county and a, a number of other partners uh, to treat the Phragmites. Uh, this year was no different than that. We did a lot of work over on the Saratoga Street <coughs> side and up around the north end of the lake. Uh, and this year, we were able to secure a contract with a group that does smashing. So we'll get to clear out some of these wetter areas that the, that the land tamers have not been able to get into for, since we started the project. The wet areas are, are just a little too difficult of an environment for the machines that we have. Uh, and so this contractor is going to be able to smash about 1,600 acres the entire Powell Slough area, so we have permissions from all the landowners in the Powell Slough, and then also down in Provo Bay, it will be kind of the, the north eastern side of Provo Bay will we'll get done and we'll, we'll run out of, of dollars that are available to us as we go through Provo Bay. There's another thousand plus acres in Provo Bay that will need to be smashed possibly next fall as part of our grants for next fall. Uh, talk, let's talk a little bit about grants. Uh, I mentioned in our last meeting that, the, that we received, we were awarded the National Parks Service Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Grant. And we we're using that. It, it is really a, a, a grant of their time so, and, and staffing. So we're using uh, their staff members to help us push on not only the entire trail plan, but specifically right now we'll be working uh, with the county and the town of Vineyard and the city of Orem on completing the trail system that, that comes right down on the south end of Sleepy Ridge and heads up and will connect into Vineyard so that Vineyard and Orem uh, folks will have a trail system that takes them right up to the front runner station and then back out through that Powell Slough area, which is a gorgeous Butler area. Uh, so we're excited about that and, and an application will go into MAG or already has. Uh, it should be that's due for, for December. For December, we'll know in January what their whether that those dollars are awarded, and and Mag operates far in advance, and so it's a couple years out before those dollars are actually able to be used. But that'll give us some time to find a match for whatever that grant amount is. So we'll be working on that with our parks, the National Park Service folks, on getting that additional grant match portion between now and when, when the actual trail gets built. Uh, the ISM, the county does, the county uh, weed supervisor does does the heavy lifting on the, the Department of Ag's Invasive Species Mitigation Fund application. 
but there's an application for 148,000 for Phragmites treatment for this coming year, so the FY19. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking at, we might have mentioned this before, but we're looking to acquire two Marshmasters. These are machines that are much more equipped than the land tamers that we purchased some number of years ago. And in addition to that, the land tamer business ceased to exist a few years ago and our, our county folks have been scrambling to engineer pieces and parts when they break, uh, which is not uncommon for them to break and so it's been very challenging for them to keep those operational. Uh, the Marshmasters have been, it's a business that's been in, around for years and years, it's out of Louisiana. They know how to get machines through the marsh and so we, we got a quote from them and we're looking at purchasing two as they kind of always have to work in tandem. And so we're looking at a $150,000 grant from the Department of Ag, uh, 50000 from DNR's Watershed Restoration Initiative, 50000 through the state uh, legislature, and that would come from potentially the restricted fund in forestry, fire, and state lands. Uh, and then Century Utah Water has uh, offered a portion somewhere around 25000 and whatever remains, we will we'll look for additional contributions and resources, and, and the commission has, also has a capital projects fund that we might uh, consider looking at uh, finalizing that purchase. So we will see what happens with all of those grant applications and then make that determination at that time. Uh, we also have another, we usually get about half of our Fragmites funding through the Department of Ag and half through DNR's Watershed Restoration Initiative, so we have a, a matching grant request that will be submitted in December uh, for 148000 uh, for additional Fragmites and invasive work. section is on lake innovation proposals. And, uh, we have uh, been working on getting wind sensors uh, installed at Utah Lake so the boaters when they get down there have a, a warning system for uh, high winds. We partnered with UDOT and they agreed to install and maintain and just provide the data from a, for a wind sensor on the south end of the lake right around mile post 17 uh, along the west side of the lake. And then the commission will be purchasing a wind sensor that will be installed at American Fork Boat Harbor. Uh, we will be funneling all of this information to MesoWest, and then we're working, Sam has been reaching out to BYU uh, to get some interns working on developing the app for that. So it would not just be wind, but it would be anything and everything that will be helpful to potential boaters and lake users on how to get to the lake, what the conditions are like, weather and so forth. Uh, and they'll they'll do some surveys and figure out what, would, what all of those elements should include. So we're excited about working with at least one of the teams from BYU and then we'll also work on with a team that uh, is familiar with developing such apps. So. I, I mentioned this in my council meeting. I had more people asking me about these things in the app to watch the wind and stuff than I've ever had anybody ask me. Really? Them, so yeah. That's I great. That's interesting. We will, we will push ahead with that. <laughs> okay, so that's my report. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Ellis regarding his report this morning? Hearing none, we will move on then. It's my pleasure to introduce. Randy Lutz, CEO of Renewable Energy Innovators Incorporated, REI, is a California native and recent transplant to Utah. He comes to us with a long history of developing renewable energy. Randy's put together a suite of sustainable solutions for improving water quality on Utah Lake for both point and non-point sources. The Utah Lake Commission signed an MOU with REI at our most recent governing board meeting, and he is here to present his vision of the lake and some of the recent sustainable <coughs> solutions. Thank you, Chair. 
Last month, as, as you, many of you were here, you asked and requested that you might get an update on our progress here in the region. Uh, and for some of you who may not have seen any of this, so I'm going to have to go pretty fast because of our limitations on time, but we can get together at another time to go dive down a little bit deeper. But I want to be able to give an up, uh, update to everyone that is here present this morning. Almost a year ago, I met with Eric in his office, and he sat and, and, and I hadn't moved here yet, and he described to me some of the challenges uh, that you all have on Utah Lake. And he looked at me and said, can you help? And I said, I think I can. And so we created uh, an MOU, which you <coughs> approved a year ago and then reinstated again last month, uh, that basically says that REI will bring comprehensive solutions, regional solutions, to restore the lake, uh, improve water quality, and enhance recreational activities. Um, uh, we also agreed that these regional solutions would include POTWs, agricultural, dairy farms, food waste, and um, uh, MSW or trash. Um, REI also said that we would uh, provide these solutions to be sustainable so they could be financed by um, the investment communities and those would be sustained through byproducts and so you'll see some of this in, in, in the description this morning. Um, at www. Let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Oops, that wasn't it. I need some help. There we go. At at www.sustainablerei.com, all of our activities are listed there. That's a very com com comprehensive site. There's over 100 pages of information and data there, uh, including our technology partners and the things that have been suggested to help engineer some solutions here, in addition to uh, our partners. And since we began, it's been overwhelming. I've been a developer for many years. And I've never felt the, I'm going to call it camaraderie, of all the cities and communities and, and even our uh, academia. As I go to the uh, BYU and some of the other institutions and look for support, we're getting a lot of it. And, and these um, partners have come to us. They're quite credible, both from an engineering standpoint as well as um, uh, knowledge and education to provide some of the solutions that you're going to see this morning. The engineers put together this comprehensive, um, I'm going to call it a, uh, a process flow diagram, that's what an engineer would call it. And uh, it shows how we'll use all these different technologies symbolic, uh, together symbiotically to provide the solutions that are needed. In of themselves, by themselves, they're not sustainable. But together, when you plug them all together, it, it provides a sustainable model that will assist us as we want to have a need to re reach our uh, <coughs> nutrient levels. In essence, basically what we're doing is we're using algae on the front end as a nutrient reduction system. Why will we use algae when algae seems to be the problem in the Utah Lake? Utah Lake is not doing anything more different than any other lake in the world. As nutrient levels increase, uh, algae grows. It feeds off of that. And so uh, uh, nature is trying to do what is best to correct the situations that are at hand. Uh, in a very similar fashion, we will use algae in a controlled environment, very large tanks that consume the algae to a level that will let us meet our nutrient um, commitments that we need to have. And we made that proposal to all the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, these are end of pipe solutions, uh, but each plan, as you know, is unique and has its own individual challenges. In some cases, the plants are older than I am. And so there's much work that needs to be done to bring these plants up to full operation capacity as we look at the infrastructure and things that need to happen within the region. And so our engineers, um, Burns McDonald and Swinnerton, have uh, over 100 years experience that can help assist the cities in these efforts to bring these plants up to code uh, and meet the requirements of, um, that are coming upon with the population as it continues <coughs> to grow. So the essence of, of our system uses a number of feedstocks in the region. This is important. This is the sustainable portion of um, our business model. So to make them sustainable, uh, the algae, we're only growing out enough algae to produce the reduction that's necessary. Um, other the food waste in the region, uh, Springville has 
800, almost a million gallons a day of uh, uh, food waste from uh, Sulphur's plant. We've got some days almost 25,000 pounds of carp uh, that are coming out of the lake. And on the west side, of course, we've got two of the largest dairy farms uh, with uh, their manure <coughs> and wastewater, as well as each one of the wastewater treatment plants have sludge. Now, um, with our an agreement with BYU, we have a pretreatment process that allows us to do something that no other digester in the United States has been able to do until uh, this project. The uh, pretreatment, in essence, allows, it breaks down the cellulistic hard shell that's around the cellulistic materials and allows us to put green waste into digesters. And this is a game changer. This is something significant that will help us reach our goals here in this region. So we can take the green waste that is filling up in our landfills and filling up in our some of our wastewater treatment plants uh, and use that as a, a feedstock for the digesters. These are very conventional digesters on the back end. Um, they produce um, CO2 and CH4. The CH4 um, biogas is sent to uh, GTL technology, which is uh, Exxon's uh, conversion, and we convert it to diesel fuel. So the commodity is diesel fuel, CO2, which can be sold to Prax Air or made for dry ice, as well as fertilizer. Those are the commodities that will pay for um, this type of projects. These are the wastewater treatment plants that you're familiar with around the lake. These are the uh, nutrient levels that are current. So these are the design <coughs> flow of the plants. These, these are what the phosphorus levels and the nitrate levels are currently at. And as most of you know, by 2020, we need to reduce our phosphorus down to one. Now some of the plants are very close now and they can meet that requirement with chemicals, <coughs> although that can be quite expensive uh, for the larger plants. So using this basic model here, we can provide a nutrient reduction system that is paid for by the commodity so it does not cost the cities anything to make this program work. Uh, on the front end, we won't get into uh, engineering discussion here, but basically the wastewater comes in from the plants, we, carb we, we put CO2 injection in, we get it into an algae growing tank, and then it's harvested. Uh, after the algae does its job, the algae then goes to the feedstocks and the digesters. Real simple process. Uh, what that does for us is provides these kind of reduction levels. So where you've got a plant at 4.8, you get a 95% reduction level on phosphorus, 99% uh, on ammonia, and 63% on uh, nitrates. Significant, where we can be compliant well out past 2020. In some cases, 2025 and 2030, as we might expect some of those other components to change over time. Uh, technology risk is minimized in, uh, through <coughs> bonded engineering from uh, Burns McDonald, well respected. Our EPC is Swinerton, uh, also bonded, $3 billion in revenue last year. They built the solar plant down in Parowan uh, last year. In less than a year, they put 100 megawatts of solar in for Utah, the largest uh, solar installation. They also have the largest digester uh, project in North Carolina uh, being constructed. It's the largest one in the U.S. And they have another one that will be <coughs> next year in Arizona that's even bigger than that. So the <coughs> uh, this, for most of our, I mean for our investors, this provides a risk mit mitigation that they need. And our OEM partners for operation of these facilities would be Violia. They um, right now manage 2.2 billion gallons of um, water being treated daily around the world. They guarantee and bond the operation performance and reduce that risk um, and make sure that we're compliant with those guarantees. Uh, the proposals that each of the cities have, and on the website, it's secured by password, but uh, the cities have the proposals that are listed, so it shows their individual um, numbers and what the reduction would be deploying a system like this. 
Um, so in essence, we're giving 95% reduction on phosphorus, 99% on ammonia, 63% on nitrogen. Uh, and with a 20-year concession agreement with the cities, uh, for all your wastewater, biosolids, and green waste, food waste, um, which are all things that you're trying to get rid of anyway, and you're paying to take to landfill or you're paying to uh, turn to, to uh, fertilizer, which isn't working for a lot of cities, we're using those and, as feedstocks to create the commodities that will pay for the installation of these facilities. We'll also take the sludge from the wastewater treatment plants, Cities don't need to do a bond or a loan or any, have any debt service. Um, we also can provide uh, uh, optional power because we power up our own installations and we can provide that to the uh, cities that might need that that are in close proximity to our nutrient plants. And of course, we've talked about bonds and performance and those kinds of things. In, in a very simplistic fashion, this is, this is what it breaks down to. So we'll finance it, we'll build it, if the cities will give us that concession agreement and all the green waste, food waste, and biosolids. And if there are other expenses of conveyance, uh, land, we also need land to put this on. So with, uh, with that, if there is additional financing that may be, need, may be needed to complete that for the conveyance or land, we can provide 1.5% financing. All of our money comes from a green fund. Uh, we receive our first tranche in December that allow us to move out with the early adopters. Just real quick, um, we are acquiring this land just to the west of TSSD. Uh, that will allow us to um, process all their green waste. Uh, as some of you may know, um, TSSD uh, <coughs> starting next year uh, won't be able to have all this green waste in here that creates the odor problems that the communities are having difficulty with. So we'll be able to take all that into our facilities. We don't have windrows, we don't have situations where the green waste is sitting there to, to cause an odor problem. We take it right in and process it. Question on that right Yes. There. Can you take in all that is being provided to you or that's available? Yes, we can. In fact, I'm worried in the winter months we may not have enough, so we're doing our green waste study now. <clears throat> but if you look at all seven cities, you have to say, do we have enough to support all seven cities? And that's what I'm kind of worried about in some cases. Uh, Salem doesn't have green waste. Uh, uh, Spanish Fork doesn't have green waste. All that's being sent out to landfill. So, so, and I do have agreements with the landfill. We can't get the green waste from the landfill. They don't want it either. So um, we can get the, that sent back our direction if we need to. We're also working with the dairy farmers on the west side. Met with Bateman Ranch and with uh, Elliot at the Church Dairy Farm to help give them solutions to clean their, their wastewater. Uh, right now they do use a simple sand filter and it really doesn't do much to take out any nutrients at all. So in working with those dairy farmers, we would do the same thing. Our first site would be on uh, Mosita. Um, that'll provide that kind of opportunity. We don't have time in this discussion to talk about landfills, but we're working with uh, Trans Jordan Landfill, 1,200 tons a day, and we're going to give them back 50% of their landfill and airspace recovery with our uh, technology that will deploy there. It will also produce 30,000 gallons of diesel a day. So what's missing in all this? There's a lot I went through in a, uh, from a technology and engineering standpoint as we focus upon our POTWs and, and how to help them meet their nutrient. But what's missing here? What's missing is the consumer side of this. We've addressed all the other issues, but I believe you could shut off the wastewater treatment plants. Having visited them, met with them, looked at their operations, you could shut these wastewater treatment plants off and you're still going to have a problem in the lake. Right? And so, What's the other component we're missing? It's the consumer piece. Over 50% of the loading in this lake, nutrient loading in the lake, comes from the environment. And so have we done anything to support, sustain, and teach uh, environmental stewardship? Because that loading, that other nutrient loading to the lake is coming from us. And so the, the man that left, family that lives up on Redford Lane as he puts nutrients or, or phosphorus on his lawn to green it up, it's going to get down here. 
and the water runoff. And we need to teach that. We need to teach these <coughs> principles. And I've asked um, uh, Zach uh, and Rob to, to take over this portion here. We're going to build a 150,000 square foot uh, facility and vineyard, we hope, as, a, as we work with uh, Anderson Geneva, that will um, be able to feature uh, many of the things you see on the screen. Zach. Well, I'm uh, excited to be here. I'm a professor in the, I'm a microbiologist and a professor at BYU in our environmental science department. I'm also on the curriculum council and develop curriculum for the life science college. And many I've, I've worked with over the last five or six years as one of the principal investigators on this $20 million grant from NSF called iUtah that was working towards uh, understanding Utah's water future. Um, this is an exciting opportunity for us, especially from an education standpoint, and one for promoting stewardship on the lake. I like this idea of Utah Lake as, as, as this jewel of our environment. And, and in the past, it has definitely been that with toboggans and the cutthroats and the showboat that would take people out to, to Bird Island and dance on the lake and have parties on the lake. It was it's such a place uh, of congregation for us. This idea behind this Utah Lake Environmental Center is an informal <laughs> learning center that helps teach people to be better stewards of their water resources that are, that are available to them. Uh, there are multiple things that we can do in incorporating uh, renewable energy technology and how we go from cradle to grave on solving our problems and being better stewards of the environment and helping a natural resource, Utah Lake, that, that we have contributed to to be in the state that it's in. Uh, we can, we can, there's multiple things, but in informal education, there's this idea that you have to have an attraction. People want to come, and when they come, you have engagement types of exercises where they participate in learning about the environment, and then those go away, and sometimes they have these aha moments when they're there, and they internalize that, and then it becomes part of that ownership. And we're really looking for people of Utah Valley and many of your constituents to become owners and, and, and stewards of this, of this wonderful resource. Some of the engagement opportunities that are allowed in a facility of this nature that has open access to walk through, has uh, different curriculum based, uh, hands-on learning exercises to become involved with the biology of the lake, the, fowl, the waterfowl of the lake, the fish of the lake, the bacteria of the lake, uh, the cyanobacteria of the lake, gives them this, this opportunity of ownership and it gets them closer to becoming part uh, of their environment. So this learning-based and query-based education is, is huge for that engagement. And that engagement is what leads to ownerships. The range of activities that we're planning for this center go just, are, are, hit all aspects of the community. First, students, little naturalist programs, right, where there's story time, educational walks, lake floats with the appropriate life preserver type of material, uh, field trips for K through 12 students, spring break and summer camps, high school volunteer internship programs. Because what we see in the center is not only a place that is teaching education, but one that is also bringing together some of these higher research questions that are being asked on the lake, where people can see science being done. There's lab space in this, in this facility where uh, researchers from BYU, Utah State, uh, and, and UVU will come together in an open lab space that will be open to the public as they walk through. There will also be uh, interactive exhibits in, in, the, in the space as well. But then once that we push the students out into the environment to, to be with the environment and work with the environment. As a, with, the, with the families, you know, it's this idea of, of educating the producers. We're not only the consumers, but we are the producers of much of of the nutrient loading that is, that is moving into the lake, but understand how to be consumers of this beautiful um, resource that we have. The, uh, the other one that I'm pushing for strongly is I feel like every attraction needs uh, something to really suck people in, and there's nothing better than uh, a freshwater feeding and petting zoo where you have the fish that people can see and you can, you can feed the carp. Yes, they are... They are, they are crazy looking, and it would be so much fun to feed them. And I'm always I'm pushing Randy to put in otters, right? So uh, the aquarium, for some reason, has sloths, right? Which I don't understand exactly how that works, but every kid loves baby sloths. Well, what's equivalent to a baby sloth in a water program is otters. And we've in the Provo River, 
had an auto recovery program. So it's not as far off as going from aquarium to sloths. But this idea, we can have recreation events, there'll be a conference facilities, special events for weddings, and it will be a place of gathering. And hopefully one that we will help people have those aha moments where they'll care about the lake and they will participate in the lake. You know, fishing and boating are wonderful, but they hit certain, certain big parts of our population. This would be one that would draw in everyone and hopefully have a, a space for, for all to learn about the environment and especially Utah Lake. Thank you, Zach. We're excited about, about this because it really is the crown of, of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here on the lake. Um, we hope to be able to, to build this facility right here off the settling pond that, that Geneva Steel uh, used for so many years. And, and we're trying to negotiate that with them now. We met with the city of Vineyard, uh, its planning commission, and it's really kind of interesting to see what they're going to be doing. This is going to turn into another version of Thanksgiving Point, and we're going to be right there if we get that property. Um, uh, on the boardwalk with new beaches, I mean, they've got big plans there. So this is going to be a significant development, and we're excited to be part of that for several reasons. One is, with our location right here, and the Linden Harbor here, or a marina, <clears throat> we, have, um, we have an opportunity to, as Zach said, to take them out and see and walk and be a part of these. So, you know, within the three minutes of the facility is a, is a 400 megawatt power facility. There's a, uh, a closed landfill, so where does your, where's my trice go? Uh, there's a transfer station. Uh, where does my poop go? I mean, every kid wants to know that, right? When he flushes the toilet. So they get to go through a wastewater treatment plant and see what that's like. As addition, in addition to that, we'll have our new tip reduction system right next door to be able to take them through that. So it facilitates the needs and the educational experience that we'd like to see the public get in that type of uh, venue, and, uh, venue and environment. Also, very exciting, um, we just contracted with an engineering company as well as with, um, that'll be working with the DWQ in developing a series of uh, online models to be available to the public at some point. Um, they developed this model for Lake Erie, which has many of the similar problems that we have, and it's an online use of satellite imagery, all the data that's been collected, uh, and uh, will help to, deli to, to um, develop the nutrient model um, with uh, for the Utah Lake, taking the data that's uh, public data that's available, all the satellite imagery, and it gives us the ability to track HABs on the lake and a five-day forecast. So they can pretty much tell from the data that uh, whereabouts is most prone for HAB activity. And on Lake Erie, it's been very, um, very accurate with what they're predicting. So it'll be a five-day HAB tracker. So when people go to the uh, go to Utah Lake, they'll know what areas that they might want to avoid. Uh, also, we talked about wind, there'll be a wind forecast model. And if we had online connectivity, you could actually see this working for Lake Erie. And we'll have that, we hope, by summer. Also, uh, other maps will show, you know, where we did our sampling, <coughs> what, the, what that sampling was, what they found, as well as wave forecast. So again, we go back to those that want to use the lake for recreational activities. We would love to make this not only available within the educational center, uh, with the data repository that we'll be collecting from all of these models, but also available to the public at the right time. And that also includes, um, uh, we're going to be doing aeration in all, after they get dredged, we'll be doing aeration in all the uh, marinas to give it some clarity. So people have a good experience when they come to the lake, they see something clean. Also, the aeration will help to mitigate uh, any algae or algae bloom in that same enclosed areas. So our goal first is to see what we can do to get our nutrient levels down to an acceptable level for <coughs> WQ and for the lake itself and to do what we we've uh, promised we would do on the front end through our MOU and then branch out into some other areas. And uh, we'll t uh, in our meeting today, uh, this next group will help to um, branch out into some of the areas that will help to restore the Utah Lake. Any questions? I know I went really fast. <laughs> but we can meet at another time if you'd like to and talk about more details as it between each of your cities. So is this presentation on your website? No, it can be.
www.sustainablerei.com. Randy, thank you very much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Very informative. We'd now like to move on. Ben Parker, a Utah native, BYU alumnus, and Saratoga Springs resident. Ben is a principal at the Arches Group and has worked on a major infrastructure projects around the globe. His background is in construction management and is here to talk about a comprehensive restoration plan for Utah Lake. Ben Parker. Well, <clears throat> I'm ex very excited to be here with you guys today. This is kind of a first step publicly for us. And uh, so ex it's exciting what REI is bringing to the table for us um, as, as citizens of Utah County. And uh, the group I'm involved with uh, is looking to further that within the lake. And today I'm just going to read a statement um, and, and not take any questions, but we look forward to returning back to you as a commission and going over actual diagrams and the things that we are proposing. So with that, I will start. One of the largest natural lakes in the western United States, Utah Lake, is a significant freshwater resource for the state of Utah. When pioneers arrived in the valley in the mid-1800s, Utah Lake was a clear water lake with a vibrant ecosystem of freshwater vegetation, aquatic and terrestrial species, shorebirds, and waterfowl. Since then, the water quality and ecological integrity of the lake has significantly deteriorated. The importance of Utah Lake, both ecologically and from a resource standpoint, cannot be overstated. The Utah Lake Commission guidance documents explain the importance of the lake. Quote, Utah Lake is the focal point of the natural resource systems that contribute, contribute to the environmental health, economic prosperity, and quality of life of area residents and visitors, end quote. In addition to being a significant water source and supply resource, or water storage and, and supply resource, the lake is important ecologically. The lake is home to many endemic fish, aquatic, and terrestrial species. Utah Lake is also an important part of the Great Basin Flyway for migratory bird species. Tens of thousands of birds utilize the lake every year for nesting, brood rearing, and during spring and fall migrations. The lake's potential as a recreational, ecological, and water resource cannot be overstated. In recent years, the ecological impairment of Utah Lake has become a, a, a significant concern. During the summer months, water quality degradation, including significant algal blooms and E. coli outbreaks, has led to weeks-long closures of the lake. This past year, during the, during the prime recreational summer months, there were only between 10 and 30 boats on the lake most days. What this means is that despite its easy access to 2 million residents along the Wasatch Front, Utah Lake is a, is a significantly underutilized as a recreation destination. The concerns on the lake are not limited to algal blooms loss of aquatic plant species from invasive carp on the lake, heavy phosphorus and nitrogen loading, evasive plant species, and other factors have transformed the lake. Instead of a clean, clear water lake, Utah Lake is now considered to be turbid, hyper-eutrophic lake with significant degraded water quality. This not only presents significant challenges from the water supply standpoint, the water has also degraded to a point where it is impacting the natural lake ecosystem. Many of the terrestrial and aquatic species of, that utilize Utah Lake have been adversely affected by the diminished water quality, loss of native plants and animal species, algal blooms, and fluctuating lake levels. Despite the efforts by the Lake Commission and Utah Lake and the state of Utah, Utah Lake continue, continues to further degrade. Without significant and comprehensive restoration efforts, the future of Utah Lake, its plants, animal species, and use of the lake by residents of the state of Utah remains uncertain. Recognizing the challenges of the lake and the need for restoration of the lake during the 2016 legislative session, 
the Utah legislature passed a concurrent resolution urging restoration of Utah Lake. That resolution, HCR 26, sponsored by Representative uh, Mike McHale and Senator Deidre Henderson, passed with significant bipartisan support. This resolution, resolution set forth important objectives for restoration of Utah Lake. We applaud <coughs> the leaders of the state and their acknowledgement of the need for these important solutions. The promise of a fully restored Utah Lake is significant. Restoration of Utah Lake re will require tremendous financial and infrastructure investments to implement the comprehensive solutions needed. These solutions must address challenges presented by the shallow lake, nutrient loading, algal blooms and invasive plants and animal species on the lake. The Arches proposes a comprehensive and accelerated restoration of Utah Lake called the Utah Lake Comprehensive Restoration Project. This comprehensive restoration project will, will restore Utah Lake in a manner that meets all of the objectives set forth by the Utah Legislature's Resolution 26. The Utah Lake Comprehensive Restoration Project is designed to protect and promote public trust values on Utah Lake. The, trust, the public trust values enhanced <coughs> by the Utah Lake Restoration Project include, but are not limited to, restoring water quality and clarity, conserving water resources in and around the lake, preserving the water storage and water supply functions of the lake, removing invasive, invasive phragmites and carp species from the lake, restoring littoral zone and other plant communities, Restoring and conserving native fish and other aquatic species, including the Bonneville cutthroat trout and June sucker. Increasing the sustainability of the lake and its surrounding areas for shorebirds, waterfowl, and other avian species. Improving navigation on the lake. Maximizing and ensuring recreational access and opportunities on Utah Lake. Enhancing recreational opportunities on the lake and otherwise improving the use of the lake for residents and visitors alike. The Utah Lake Comprehensive Restoration Project will likely become the largest environmental restoration project in the country. At the appropriate time in the, future, in the near future, we'll, we will release the detailed uh, proposal outline, outlining the Utah Lake Comprehensive Restoration Project, including the engineering and infrastructure aspects of the project and the likely costs associated with the, full, the fully implementing design, infrastructure, engineering, and environment, environmental restoration of Utah Lake. As daunting and intractable as many of the challenges on the lake currently are, through years of research and study, our team has developed the engineering, design, and infrastructure solutions necessary to comprehensively restore Utah Lake with all of its original vibrancy and ecological, ecological integrity. In addition to the work of our team, we recognize that successful restoration of the lake will require, will also require significant collaboration by the, by the state, local government stakeholders, and Utah residents. We are committed to working with all state, local government agencies, and interested stakeholders on the ongoing basis throughout this process. Restoring Utah Lake is long overdue. Considering its size, location, and ecological importance of Utah Lake, the promise of a comprehensive restoration is, the, is, an, is an objective worthy of such monumental collaboration and investment by the state and its citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. We look forward to seeing your proposals. Thank you. to hear from Melissa Stamp as a project coordinator for the Utah Reclamation, Mitigation, and Conservation. I seem to have hit a hiccup. Check back in a few. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking my mind. This commission is required by the Central Utah Project Completion Act and is leading the efforts to complete the Provo River Delta Restoration Project. Melissa is regularly attends the Utah Lake Commission Technical Committee and is a great asset for the efforts on Utah Lake. With that introduction, we'll hear from Melissa Stan. Well, we'll let the pickups go on, but um, 
really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to introduce or reintroduce you to the Provo <coughs> River Delta Restoration Project. Um, I'm only going to spend a couple minutes with a couple introductory slides, then we're going to show you our project video, which was prepared fairly recently. It's about an eight minute video. And then Mark Holden, the executive director of our agency, will finish things off. So the Provo Delta project is located down at the mouth of mm -hmm. the Provo River where it enters Utah Lake. Utah Lake State Park is down at the bottom left of this slide here. And the project involves acquiring about 300 acres of agricultural land outlined in the black and white checked line there and creating a new river and delta area. Skipper Bay Dyke along the west side of the project will be partially removed and lowered to allow Utah Lake uh, to expand eastward. And why do this project? Well, really at its heart, the Delta Restoration Project is tied to recovery of the endangered tube suffer. So every spring, thousands of adult fish swim up the lower Provo River, lay eggs, so those eggs hatch, larval fish drift downstream, and then they all either starve to death or get eaten by predators. And that creates a bottleneck in the life cycle of this fish, um, which means they can't be sustainably uh, restored and we have to continue relying on the hatchery provided fish to maintain the population. And so what we're hoping to do with this project is to recreate some of that restored delta habitat, the warmer, more productive, food rich areas that provide the proper nursery habitat for the June sucker. The existing lower river channel just doesn't provide that. It's a lot more like this cartoon fishbowl, deeper, colder water where young suckers are very vulnerable to predatory fish. A couple other project purposes include um, implementing some recreational improvements and opportunities, as well as providing supplemental flow deliveries to improve in-stream flow conditions. And I'll just finish with a couple of maps that highlight the two main areas of the project. This map is showing the northern delta area that will be created, the number of the different recreational amenities that will be developed. And then this map is along the existing lower Provo River channel, which will be maintained. Flows will be provided to this existing lower river channel, and various recreation features are also planned for this area. And I'll let the video kind of get into the details on some of those. Provo River separated into a fan of tributaries that meander through grassy wetlands before meeting Utah Lake. This delta area created a nutrient-dense habitat for birds, game, and fish as the water flowed into Utah Lake, one of the largest freshwater lakes west of the Mississippi. Today, that vast and vital delta area has disappeared. The lower Provo River is now channeled and functions like a narrow arm of Utah Lake rather than a river delta. Scientists working to restore the Utah Lake ecosystem and recover the endangered June sucker that depends upon it have discovered that they must recreate the delta to provide the necessary habitat the fish needs to survive. Recreating the delta will help re-establish a beautiful aquatic environment that helps the fish, but will also provide a unique recreational opportunity in the middle of a growing urban area. These efforts will help to ensure that important water projects linked to the recovery of the June sucker stay on track, which is good for everyone in the region that needs and benefits from this water. When early pioneer settlers arrived in Utah Valley, they began to carve a place for themselves on the land, and this included the delta area. The fish became a dietary staple for families all along the Wasatch Front and beyond, and farming and ranching in the rich delta area was a way of life. It was very rustic 
life. They had to carve out an existence out of basically nothing. And through their efforts, they created these great communities that we're all proud to live in. They didn't do that, though, without some cost. They had to dam rivers, and they had to put in infrastructure so that they could water their crops, so they could survive. Through this and other human impacts, the Delta slowly began to disappear. Historically, you would have had a beautiful spreading Delta that was large and expansive as that river joined with Utah Lake, and the Delta will replace a small piece of that. You have the Provo River in this case, which starts 75 miles upstream. As it flows down, it then is going to merge with Utah Lake. 96,000 acres at high elevation. That's a unique opportunity then for these blending of the two habitat types. And so what the restoration project will do is provide a few hundred acres for that mingling of the different habitats to occur. In 1986, the June sucker was listed as an endangered species, and the lower five miles of the Provo River were designated as critical habitat. Utah Lake has been impacted by human activities over 150 years that have really put a strain on the lake, and June sucker is an indicator of what has happened there. By recovering the June sucker, we're reversing some of those impacts and hopefully making Utah Lake a better system for the fish, but for all the human uses at the same time. To recover the June sucker and nurture Utah Lake and its ecosystem back to health, many entities have joined forces and are now working collaboratively under the June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program with the goal of turning back the clock and allow the Provo River and Utah Lake to meet once again as a functioning delta. The delta will provide that habitat for those young June sucker to be able to eat and grow and hide for a little while until they're big enough to be able to make it into the lake and continue their life cycle as they normally would. The Provo River Delta Restoration Project is one of the most complex recovery efforts to date. With this sufficient progress that we'll be able to make because of the Delta, it'll help us to meet those agreements that we have in place with Fish and Wildlife so that we can continue to complete the Utah Lake system that's a key portion of the Bonneville unit of the Central Utah Project. And that will make us able to meet those water commitments that we have in place with our water petitioners to be able to deliver water to the millions of people that live along the Wasatch Front as the Wasatch Front continues to grow and expand, we'll be able to meet those future water demands. Water in the Provo River makes a magnificent journey while playing a significant environmental, cultural, recreational, an economic role along the way. As part of the Delta Restoration Project, the majority of the lower Provo River flow will be directed north of its current channel, creating a suitable June sucker spawning habitat and braided waterways. Utah Lake will be allowed to expand eastward to more closely approach its historic shoreline. A guaranteed flow of water will continue running in the existing river channel. A small dam will be constructed at the downstream end of this channel, near Utah Lake, to maintain a relatively constant water elevation year-round. An aeration system will be installed to improve water quality, aesthetics, and odor. People who come and, and visit the Provo River Delta will have a unique opportunity to see one of the rare treasures of, of the Provo River. There'll be trails along the perimeter of the Delta that give people a chance to kind of get out and get a unique vantage point, take part in different recreational aspects. A Delta is unique because it occurs where two different habitat types come together. The flowing river comes down and meets the lake and it becomes a very dynamic, a very vibrant system that supports a lot of different diversity. The Delta project will really complement Utah Lake State Park, the Provo River Trail System, and the other recreational opportunities on the lake. I see it as enhancing people's experience for the lake overall, and specifically for park users. Much as we've seen in the Heber Valley in response to the restoration project up there, we think the public is just going to love this area. We expect it's going to be used a lot for non-motorized boating, canoes, kayaks, paddleboarding, 
that kind of opportunity is certainly going to increase with the Delta project. There will be new fishing, boating, and wildlife viewing opportunities. Trails in the area will be expanded and improved. The trail along the existing river channel will remain, and features will be added to enhance users' experiences. Access points will be provided to allow people to more easily reach the river on foot, and there will be places for launching and portaging non-motorized boats. A new loop trail will allow people to amble along the perimeter, and if feasible, a trail will be built into the delta to let people experience the natural wetlands up close. An equestrian trail will also be built. The area will offer convenient parking lots, public restrooms, educational signage, benches, and two observation towers to provide views of the Delta, Utah Lake, the city, and surrounding mountains. By restoring the Delta's ecosystem, the Provo River Delta Restoration Project will allow people to experience the Provo River and Utah Lake as our earliest ancestors did. These natural wetlands will once again support the June sucker and other wildlife. There is something magical about the point at which a river begins to slow down, branches out like a tree, and empties slowly into the lake. The Provo River Delta will be a special place in our community and become a legacy for our children, grandchildren, and the state of Utah. I brought a few copies of the video if anyone wants to take those or if we don't have enough um, let us know and we'll get you some. I also have a sign up here if anyone wants to be on our newsletter mailing list. We send those out two or three times a year. It will not overwhelm your email box. Um, but we'd love to get that video kind of more broadly out there on websites wherever. Um, Mark's got a couple of closing slides for us. Thanks Melissa. While she's uh, transitioning us back to the slideshow, I'd just like to say I'm really encouraged by a lot of the discussion and the presentations I've heard here this morning. You know, it seems like there's just tremendous interest in Utah Lake as a uh, resource, not only for its ecological values, but for recreational opportunities and economic uh, opportunities as well. Um, thank you. One of the things I, I just wanted to touch on, you know, why are we involved? And by we, uh, mean in this case specifically our agency, the Mitigation Commission, Central Utah Water, the uh, Department of the Interior, as well as the entire June Sucker Recovery Program. Uh, <coughs> and the particular involvement of our three agencies has to do with some uh, commitments that were made as planning went forward and as the uh, finishing components of the Central Utah uh, project are being implemented in Diamond Fork as well as the Utah Lake System, which is going to distribute some of that water in Utah County into uh, uh, northern Utah County. The continued development and ongoing operation of the Bonneville Unit, and that's a portion of the Central Utah project, it's dependent upon us uh, maintaining or achieving sufficient progress uh, with June Sucker Recovery. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, to date, uh, this program's been very effective and has uh, made uh, sufficient progress. Uh, there are also a few authorizations under CUPCA that uh, were provided to the Commission, improving warm water fisheries, rehabilitating riparian areas, uh, providing compatible recreation opportunities, uh, fish passage on the Provo River, uh, June Sucker in particular, and to acquire and deliver in-stream flow water, all of which are uh, involved in a part of this project. Uh, I'm not sure which button to hit there. One on the right. One of the things I just wanted to point out, we took a look at a few of the local planning documents, you know, that affect Utah Lake, Utah County, this area in particular, and, you know, we found that there are you know, 19 specific uh, objectives or vision statements within the Utah Lake Master Plan that 
that the Delta Restoration Project uh, addresses, either directly or uh, in an ancillary manner. It's already been talked about, the concurrent resolution passed this year by the governor and the legislature about restoration of Utah <coughs> Lake and its opportunities. Uh, the Utah Department of Natural Resources has no fewer than uh, three divisions that have significant involvement and uh, missions involving uh, this project. Provo City, uh, in their planning document, Vision 2030, they have eight uh, goals and 29 objectives that are addressed uh, by the project. Uh, similarly, the Utah County General Plan, uh, as well as June Sucker Recovery Implementation Program. So the project uh, ha has a lot of uh, goals and objectives that are in line with, uh, it seems like a lot of where this commission is trying to go from. Um, you notice through the video that we heavily emphasized really the recreational opportunities. And that's because that's really the way that we expect most of the public is going to interact with the Delta Restoration Project. It's through the, the trails, the viewing towers, the learning opportunities and so forth, the fishing. Uh, just taking a quick look at the importance economically of fishing, uh, every five years the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does a nationwide study to determine what impact fishing, hunting, and wildlife viewing has on uh, local economies. And nationwide, uh, 36 million people uh, fished in 2016, uh, adult age uh, fish, and they spent over $46 billion in pursuit of that uh, activity. And so nationally, as well as locally, it's a huge driver. Wildlife watching is probably one of the, well, it is the largest and most actively growing component of the outdoor recreational uh, activities of fishing, hunting, and wildlife viewing. And over 86 million people nationwide spent 76 million dollars, uh, billion dollars, excuse me, on those activities last year. Uh, um, looking a little bit closer to home, uh, that survey also produces individual state reports. The individual reports are not yet available uh, for 2016, but going back to the 2011 report, a million Utah residents and non-residents either fish, hunted, or watch wildlife in the state of Utah. And uh, in pursuit of those activities, they spent $1.7 billion on those activities. And of course, that's just the expenditure. That's not the total economic impact. Uh, as expenditure, uh, expenditures go get into the economy, they turn over, uh, and typically on an area, you know, two to three times that, uh, to measure the true economic impact. One thing I like uh, especially about this slide, this economic data is about anglers and wildlife viewers 16 years and older, because those are the ones that typically spend the money. But it's so important that we get the youth involved in these activities and uh, developing an appreciation for the environment, how it works, and how we interact with that environment. Um, Recreation, including aquatic-based or uh, water-based recreation, is extremely popular in the state. 72% of Utah's residents uh, participate in some form of outdoor recreation each year. And that uh, generates $12.3 billion in consumer spending. A significant portion uh, of that recreational activity that involves water. As Melissa uh, pointed out and as was mentioned in the video, uh, these are just some of the highlights of the features that are going to be provided. Uh, we've also been coordinating with Provo City as they plan and uh, implement the Provo Lakeview Parkway and Trail, which will come right up through this area. Uh, they will have a trail along the west side of that parkway, and our trail will connect with that and will uh, enhance the trail system in, in that area. Yeah. Along the existing river channel, as uh, Melissa mentioned and the video pointed out, 
a number of uh, amenities and improvements. Uh, trailhead will be constructed uh, up here at Lakeshore Drive. We're working in partnership right now along with the Utah Lake Commission and others for uh, Utah Lake Park to expand and develop a uh, public access point down there. And we're excited about that opportunity that came along as well. Okay, I think I'll just cut it off right there. Uh, if, are there any questions or uh, comments that we can address? Okay, sounds good. Okay, thanks. Thank you. If you'd like now to hear from our technical committee, Mike, can you start us off, please? I, I would be happy to do that, Mayor. By the way, you look very good in that clean shape. I've never seen you clean shape. I was actually embarrassed. That's why I moved here. <laughs> um, but I appreciate the opportunity. I don't have a lot of new information to add. The technical committee did meet back in October, and we discussed many of the things that you've been bringing on here this morning. The one thing I would point out, at our last meeting, I mentioned we were getting our CARP monitoring results coming in. Um, as you heard, over the course of, of the morning, we've removed over 25 million pounds of CARP from Utah Lake since 2010. And we've monitored annually to see what that has done to the CARP population. And as of August, we have reduced the CARP density, meaning basically pounds per acre out in Utah Lake by 83%. When we started this program, our goal was to achieve a 75% reduction. And there were plenty of people who didn't think that was possible through the techniques that we were employing. And we've gotten there. We, we have seen that reduction out in Utah Lake. And as a result, we're seeing areas where we're getting submerged vegetation, which was our goal in, in doing this project. Um, that is not to say that we're going to walk away now and that we're done. We still need to maintain pressure on the system and keep that car population in check. And if you recall throughout our meetings this year, I've reported <coughs> that the carp removal hasn't been going well and that we've been struggling to find fish. And getting these results back at the end of the summer kind of indicate why we, we have struggled to find the fish. Because there's fewer out there. We've, we've strained a lot of water through the nets. And, haven't found as many fish. And typically, what we thought would happen is we moved into September, the carp tend to congregate more as, as things cool off, and our fishing really hadn't picked up until I'm visiting with the commercial fishermen yesterday. They have had a great last week. So starting about Wednesday of last week, catches really started to pick up. And for whatever reason, maybe you can hit a uh, critical time where the carp are congregating now. We're achieving some higher removal. Hopefully that lasts going into December. Hopefully this is not going to be a good week and it disappears. But we have the goal of removing 3 million pounds in 2017. We're not going to get there. Um, today we removed about 2 million pounds. Um, with the grade last you know, essentially six weeks <coughs> left in the year, it, it would be wonderful if we could approach 2.5 million pounds. I think that's feasible. Um, that's my update. We'd be happy to take questions. But I know that Eric and Scott have. Any questions from the board for Mr. Mills or the technical committee? All right, Mike, thanks for that report. Erica, yes. you, from, from your side, please. From our side. Well, I'm pleased to report that we have finally engaged in a contractor with a facilitator for our Utah Lake study. It's been a long process in state procurement, um, but we <laughs> have arrived. Um, so we selected um, a company called Resolve. They are based out in Washington, D.C. They've got 40 years of experience facilitating processes around contentious natural resource issues. We're fortunate to have one of their um, team members based here in Logan, Utah. He's not done any work in Utah, which we see as a real benefit to us because he comes completely independent, brand new to our process, to our <coughs> issue, um, and we think we'll bring independent uh, ability to facilitate that process. So um, he's working. Otherwise, the projects that he shared with us, they're related. He's done a lot of work in the Missouri River Basin, facilitating a process between the Army Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and a number of contentious water related problems, um, and also up in the Five West River in Oregon. What did you say his name was? His name is Paul DeMorgan. And, uh, we're really looking forward to introducing him to the group. Um, 
Resolve has teamed with SWCA um, to bring in some water quality expertise um, in terms of uh, you know, making sure materials are accurate and things as, as we move forward. So the three primary elements that this contractor will do for us. First, they'll be doing a situation <coughs> assessment, which will involve interviews with um, many of you and those of, those of the members of the steering committee for our project. Um, that will be done first. We'll be picking off some steering committee meetings shortly after that and um, trying to see the science panel relatively. Um, but I want you to, to understand this is not just um, somebody that's going to come in and chair meetings. He's facilitating the whole process. Um, so after that situational assessment, he'll take a look at the process that we are organized and that you've all and he may re make recommendations to adjust based on the, the interviews and the comments that he hears from, from all of you. So we're very excited to finally be getting started. Um, I know it's felt like uh, nothing's happening on this, this million dollar study that we've been talking about, but I think you'll start to see things moving on. So, <coughs> so any questions about that? The decision was made um, Eric Ellis and DWQ made that, um, selected the contractor together as co chairs of this group. Erica, thank you for that report. Oh, while I have the floor, can I also introduce Jim Harris, um, who has taken my own position as assistant director, and he will be my alternate for the utility commission. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Item 8 on our agenda says membership on the Utah Lake Commission amendments. Our bylaws are stated in such way that it specifically calls out who are members of the Utah Lake Commission as voting members. We are studying that through the help of the Utah County Attorney's Office. We're looking at some ways of uh, uh, preparing a red line cover of bylaws to be reviewed by this body in our March Governing Board meeting. Anything you want to add to that, Mr. Ellis? No, we'll, we'll work through the, the comments based on our last meeting. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and create a, a language that allows this body to entertain the proposal of adding new members. And if, if it's your desire to do so, you will have that opportunity to add a new entity into this group. And the item number nine, is there anything that Sam would like to add to what he's already had this morning? Sam? Just briefly. Um, Eric, meant, Eric already talked about the items on there, the wind sensors and the app development, so we're excited about that. Um, I just wanted to highlight two things briefly, that we're continuing to improve um, cooperative communication efforts, so it's been a great help from all of your agencies, as well as other um, organizations we've worked with to help spread um, any and all information about Utah Lake, um, so that the public is receiving that in a variety of manners. Um, and also we're working on continuing to improve our efforts uh, on my behalf in communications. Um, I continue to go through a variety of courses and certifications. Um, I recently certified in social media strategy officially, and then I've also been taking search engine optimization courses, which is basically learning how to make our website um, more easy to find when people search stuff online. So researching what keywords they use, what topics they're interested in, and developing our pages appropriately so that they can find those resources. So just a, I guess a comment that we continue to improve our efforts as well as we thank everyone else for continuing to improve their efforts in helping uh, with communication on the lake. Thank you, Sam. I'd like to remind everyone that our governing board meetings for the year 2018, March 22nd, June 11th, September 27th, and November the 15th. And every November, we don't use the third Thursday. We have to move it up a week because of Thanksgiving, and so that's why it's at the same Time the second week in November uh, next year as well. <coughs> when I started this morning, I failed to mention we had a couple of gentlemen to be excused. Robin Pearson, the vice chair of the Utah Lake Commission, member of the uh, Natural Resources of Division of State and Government, and also Mayor Sheldon Wimmer from Alpine asked to be excused today as they had conflicts. Yes. We now get comments from the general membership of the board as well as the public. Anybody around the table have comments to make this morning? Any public comments from the committee? Please, state your name, sir. Sure. Uh, <coughs> my name is uh, Lavier Merritt, and uh, I've had uh, a long experience in working with the lake, 
And so if you, any of you have uh, issues or questions or want information on the lake, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to work with you on that. Uh, it's exciting to see uh, alternatives appearing on the lake. Uh, many of the things that are proposed uh, have tremendous challenges associated with them. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly, if some of those come to fruition, it will greatly enhance the, the usability of the lake, which is the desire of all of us. And uh, so uh, I wish all those who are working on these uh, projects uh, uh, good luck in, in working through all these difficult problems because they are multiple and they are uh, sometimes very naughty. And uh, with that, then I'll just uh, conclude that statement. Thank you. Sam, uh, Eric, you have his, uh, contact his contact information? Yes. So we can pass it out to our consultants and others who are interested. Thank you. Yes, Councilwoman from Woodland Hills. Yes, Sorry. I just wanted to um, express thanks to those who have served with our recent municipality elections. We will have a change to our board. And I just wanted to thank those who are moving on to new things for participation and especially for when you may have felt for your willingness to chair this council. There will be many new faces around the table come March. I will be here to chair the meeting. Even though I will not be an elected official come March, I will still open the meeting and chair till we get a new chair and vice chair appointed. So again, uh, thank you for that. Remind you that our next March, our next meeting will be the 17th of March. And with that, we will stand adjourned. Thank you.